Thank you very much for your talk and for allowing us having the time to discuss it. Yes. Um, Lander, Cohen, and Austin. Well, thank you very much for that talk. Um, I, maybe I wanted to make a, a, a f just a factual observation and then um, engage you on, on the question of how personalized medicine might be uh, failing to serve the common good. Uh, just factually, the, the, the shift in language from personalized to precision was a branding issue. All of us who were engaged found it very annoying that when the word personalized medicine was used, people would come up and say, oh, do you mean you're going to make a treatment for me? And so when Sue Desmond Hellman and Charles Sawyers were asked to chair the, the Institute of Medicine report, one of the things that they deliberately did was to change the word. Mm. Because personalized meant focus this small, precision meant there might be many foci, in a sense stratified, but better branding. So it was clearly a branding issue because empirically people didn't get the point with personalized. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it might even be worth researching a little bit the history of that shift. And Obama shifted because in 2009 his advisor was bought into the, the then common personalized language. But by 2015, I was part of this, this initiative there, the NIH had fully shifted over and the language just came to the White House from the NIH. Hmm. So there's a, there's a pretty interesting, simple hmm. historical path that, that I think is, is correct about what you're saying and you can even find the individuals who did it. Um, but then to the, the deep question you're raising about personalized medicine and whether it is against the common good. A couple of points. Um, the Bermuda Dec Declaration in 1996, and again, I was part of this, was very much about information, that all of this information should be freely available because of the fights with Craig Venter, who wanted to privatize the information. And the idea was that the public would be, that, that, that genetic information was a public good mm -hmm. that would launch thousands of drugs and thousands of studies. But then the question is to deliver a drug for any given purpose, the drug itself in the bottle is a private good because it is going to need a tremendous amount of, of private investment to do it. Now you raise a question that bothers me too. Why is it so expensive? Mm -hmm. Or is it, you know, what does it do to society that it's so expensive? And I share your concern, but let me for the sake of argument take the opposite side. A patent lasts for 20 years. It then expires, and that becomes generic. At that point, in a properly functioning market, which I admit we do not fully have, but in a properly functioning market, there should be generic competition for these. Mm -hmm. So another way to read this is we are paying, for a period of 20 years, some exorbitant prices, and patients are paying exorbitant prices, and we have access problems, but on the other side of that, for all time thereafter, those should be generic treatments that we should have competition that brings them down. Mm -hmm. And I worry about the interim period, mm -hmm. and I also worry about the barriers that prevent things from becoming inexpensive generics, but you could imagine that that is the transition there, and this should not be a permanent uh, inaccessible price and I think we saw from Chris Austin's talk that the allele-specific oligos in Spinraza used for spinal muscular atrophy then gave rise immediately to an idea for Batten disease, which gives an idea for another disease. So many of these may be first path things right. and extendable. Okay, thank you. First of all, it's very interesting to know that it's not just me saying this is branding. <laughs> it's actually there in the, in the oh, excuse me. Just closer to me, yeah, thanks. Um, so it's interesting that it's not just me being <laughs> cynical, but it's really there, really happened. Okay, as far as pricing and generics, yes, this is a huge issue. Um, I think we also need to bear in mind the communitarian way in which many of the drugs arose. I mean, if we, I mentioned the Greenberg case yesterday, which is a much earlier case, 2003, um, in which the parents of um, children with a specific genetic condition um, 
actually contributed to the development of testing kits, not so much drugs, I think, but they might have been in the pipeline. Um, but despite the fact that they had contributed because of the doctrine in law, and this was a tissue case rather than a genetics case as such, well, there's some genetics, um, that there is no property in human tissue, you know, the race nullius doctrine in law, they were not able to claim any rights, whereas the researcher, who was not actually an expert geneticist, but merely you know, the local hospital doctor, uh, was able to develop these kits, despite the fact that the Greenbergs and other kind of undiseased families had actually helped to create a database, they'd helped put money in, they'd given the tissue of their dead children, and yet they were found to have very few rights. So the argument which is always made by the companies or whoever is taking out the patent, in this case it was an individual clinician, um, is well, I've put effort and money and expertise into developing this and I need you know, the financial reward. So we need first of all to look at the origins as well as what happens afterwards. But I think your proposal about generics after 20 years is certainly something worth looking at. Yeah, in the long run, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I want to ask uh, if you could clarify about one point with respect to the justification of the uh, uh, communitarian uh, uh, view. Uh, now, there can be many justifications for that, and, and you elaborate on some, but one specific uh, point is the idea of the genome as the common heritage of humanity. Now, if some resource is a common heritage, essentially, and, and not a private thing, then it, it, it can go a long way in justifying distributive justice, because at any event, you know, it's essentially a, uh, not a private, but a common thing, so obviously we should use it communally. Uh, on, but, but of course, the genome is deeply ambivalent in this sense. It's, it's deeply private in one mm -hmm. sense, and yet it's a common thing on, on the other, from the other direction. Uh, so I was wondering what kind of justificatory uh, work you think that this idea of common genome does for the communitarian yes, idea? Yes, thank you. I mean, it could just be seen as rhetoric. It's more than rhetoric. Um, the human genome is different from other resources such as land in that we simply are, well, I know this is genetic reductionism, but we are intimately involved with our genomes in a way that we are not with land. Uh, however, Eleanor Ostrom and others uh, have used the argument about the genetic commons, or sorry, about the land commons, uh, which has been the basis of many environmental movements. And as far as the genome goes, the idea of enclosure of the human genome by aggressive patenting, I'll take away the aggressive patenting, shall we say, uh, has been widely suggested and widely used and was used, for example, in the case I was talking about, the Myriad case against the patenting of BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, so those are legal cases, and lawyers tend to be quite hard-headed uh, and, you know, can be rhetorical, but are also very specific. And the specific harms that were done by the BRCA1 and BRCA2 monopoly patenting um, were well delineated in the action that was brought by that sort of rainbow coalition of the American Civil Liberties Union, Southern Baptist Convention, individual patients, uh, Elizabeth Ceriani, who was the lead plaintiff, I think, uh, and of course the American Pathological, Path Pathologists Association, so uh, professional bodies. So they were all rallying behind this communitarian ideal. I mean, I, that's how I would see it. Um, in terms of opposing enclosure of the genetic commons. If you could speak to something a little, a little different, but it's related. That is, um, w what do you think of the developing iconography of our um, field? That is, and it's, it's particularly strikes me sitting in this room where there happens to be another icon in back of you back there. <laughs> But where I come from, the icon is the double helix, mm -hmm. quite literally. 
the, you see it on every wall. Yep. People have this almost mystical sense of it, the way some people have a mystical sense yep. of that icon. And they worship it in a quite real sense, and that, that it has deep meaning to them. Mm. And it, it has this beautiful structure, yeah. which, which is also quite hypnotic. And it, it has evolved over the last 15 years from, from I think, what, what I was used to, which is exactly what you said, it's a common heritage, mm -hmm. to, to being deeply uh, personal, but something which, which, um, which, is, which is, uh, is something which is almost a, uh, has, has this sort of mystical mm -hmm. quality. Yeah. And, and it leads to uh, perhaps what uh, for geneticists is the original sin, which is genetic determinism. That is that the genes are important, but they're not everything. Yeah. And I think geneticists know that more than anybody, but all of the factors that you're talking about have driven us in the opposite direction. So what, what role does all of that play in, in what you're talking about? Well, I agree with you about the sort of sacred nature of the helix. I mean, um, I have an honorary appointment at a center in Oxford University, which we called Helex, yeah. because its lawyers are. <laughs> so it's H-E-L-E-X. Um, yeah, I think it's a tremendously important symbol. The broader question about the power of the genetic mystique, as it's been called, uh, in that very influential book. Um, and perhaps Jenny Riordan might want to come in on this too, because you've recently written a book with similar points, I think, um, is extremely powerful. And to my mind, that is another reason why we have to make sure that we medicine is not overlooked with the focus on genetic me medicine. The power of the symbol, the power of the iconography works in favor of me medicine. We don't have anything similar yeah, yeah. for we medicine. Not that I can think of. Yeah. Jenny, did you want to say anything? We, uh, we have Prainsack, Wilson, and Boniolo. Nicole. Fine. Nicole. Um, so thank you very much, Donna. Um, this was really, really important. I, I want to say one thing about labeling, and then I want to um, ask a question just to push the argument further, not because I disagree at, at all with anything of what you said. First, um, um, Eric, your note about precision medicine and, and as a rebranding exercise is very, very appreciated. But I think it's, and, and sort of uh, keeping in mind Farhat's uh, reminder to always clarify what place we talk about. I think it's important to note that initially precision medicine was a very American story. Um, in Europe, a lot of people actually didn't want to use that term because it was seen as American hyperbole. And uh, I spoke to many people in the UK in particular who said, we use stratification because that's a British way of saying things. Um, however, what happened since then is that um, more and more colleagues and also funders and policymakers are using the label of precision to indicate um, a shift away from sort of genomic medicine or personal medicine as seen as a genomic medicine to a um, data-driven way of personalizing, and that is precision medicine. So there's a very interesting shift here. But so there's also a small group of us, um, Donna, as you may know, who would try to sort of reappropriate um, the notion of personalized medicine, and there are people um, who are affiliated with the realistic medicine movement in Scotland, um, Trisha Green of in Oxford and others who say actually we can define what personalization means and, and that really means bringing in the person that means reducing waste in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is why I'm asking this question to you. If we understand personalization also as um, um, asking people what they want, considering individual characteristics of, of, of patients to really reduce waste, so, so trying to not give people treatments that they don't benefit from. Um, in such a context, would that be serving the public good, the common good, or would, would that still be in a, in, a, in a tension to the common good? So I'm asking a, a, a sort of personalization in this way, which 
foreground the mm -hmm. individual person? Would that be in attention with the common good or would that be serving the common good? That's a very big and important question. Um, what I'm really, all I can do in this space of time is to suggest some of the difficulties in a justice-based approach. Uh, but many people have written more than, than I have, although I have written some, on this topic. I think when you have a body such as NICE in the UK, which is ostensibly, which is actually charged with being a representative body for the country, uh, England as a whole, Scotland has its own consortium, um, that it does represent or sets out to represent the common good. But the classic problem here is regulatory capture. <laughs> so that whenever you have a body of that kind, it is vulnerable to either um, arguments made by, when I say interest groups, I don't use it pejoratively. I, I mean that disease patient associations, for example, have an important role to play. But because the media tends always to sympathize with those who are denied the treatment, they do have a very powerful influence which may conflict with the common good. So it's, the job is to know what constitutes the common good. NICE has somewhat bypassed the discussion by setting the 30,000 limit. But in fact, it has overridden that, as you know, in many cases. Uh, and because Scotland has a different, different set of laws uh, and a different body, it has, for example, in the case of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, for some time there was a treatment which was allowed in England and not in Scotland, but more typically it's the other way around because Scotland actually spends more. So, and I think has a stronger concept of the common good, actually. Uh, so there is a tension. And the question is, it's really, this is a political question. Uh, I would not actually say that it's just something that we can leave up to individual nation states, because there are, you know, we're getting into Eric's talk yesterday, really, uh, because there are common commonalities with these questions about justice. But it is not one that I can really, you know, tackle at any greater length this morning. But it's a major question, so thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. I tend to start gesturing. <laughs> so, thanks very much for that talk. I think I agreed with nearly all of it, but I think maybe the one thing I'd like to push you on, similar to, to Barbara, is, is whether there's um, more room than you seem to allow for for uh, we medicine to, as it were, to reappropriate uh, me medicine. Because I was thinking about uh, some of the ways within which you know, socialised systems such as the NHS is attempting to personalise treatment, or at least to to stratify it so that one of the projects I've been involved in at the moment is about using the data that's already available within um, social care, running machine learning on that, trying to work out well, what are the signs that we can see from the notes that are taken by social workers that somebody, for example, could be going to have a fall in the next three or six months so that you, you can take something which is very much about we medicine, it's about how do we protect the most vulnerable people, but we're using those big data analytics as part of a, a we medicine system and, and that might be the best of of both worlds, perhaps. So there may be room for, for we medicine to think about, well, here's what's important about precision. It's about doing the best for individuals, particularly the most vulnerable people, and we can use these techniques rather than thinking that yeah. it's, a, it's, it's alien to us. Oh, absolutely. I wasn't saying there's an absolute opposition between them. I was arguing for building bridges between them uh, and arguing that we need to remember we medicine because it does tend to get forgotten in the flurry of publicity. But yes, that's a, a very good example of ways in which public health measures, uh, community medicine measures, could benefit from what has been developed in genomic medicine. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Donna, for, for your talk. Uh, uh, your talk was a little bit different from the talk given by, by, by Christopher. And uh, uh, where you were speaking, uh, uh, I saw that uh, uh, many times here in the audience, uh, there are a sort of two parties. One uh, with a sort of a strong enthusiasm in uh, personal life medicine or precision medicine. The other with uh, a lot of doubts about uh, personal life medicine and precision medicine. Uh, speaking sometimes to different languages, to different technical languages. So with some problems of also comprehension between the, between the two. 
And uh, uh, the one thing that uh, precision medicine is a sort of panacea for a kind of, of disease. The other thinking that uh, oh, it's a sort of uh, extremely problematic. But sometimes the precision medicine works. Uh, I am a philosopher. I had a cancer, uh, and I was so lucky to work at that time in a, in a department of experimental oncology of a comprehensive cancer center. Uh, they took pieces of my body, and uh, the pieces went back and forth from the bench to the, 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 the bed, the bench and the bed. Uh, 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 my cancer was stratified. I was stratified. Uh, uh, but uh, the person that take extremely care of me, uh, I had a personalized uh, treatment. And so uh, at the end of the day, I was so lucky that there, there is, or there was, and there still is, uh, a personalized medicine or precision medicine. So, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, when we speak about personalized medicine or precision medicine, if we were scientists, we should be aware of the problem that this approach presents. But if you are not a, a scientist, we should be aware also of the benefit that this kind of approach could uh, uh, bring with itself. Uh, uh, because otherwise, we are a sort of... Uh, um, uh, so to say, the Italian uh, term is manicheo. I don't know it's uh, the English terms for manicheo. manicheo. It's, the same. it's the same because yeah, it's Latin. It's the same, yeah. So, yeah, dualistic. What do you say? Well, I'm very glad you recovered <laughs> or a remission from your cancer. That's wonderful. Oh. Uh, uh, I would just like not to get into Manichaean dualism, actually. I've always worked in medical schools, <laughs> uh, and I've learned although I'm not medically trained, um, I have worked with a lot of very excellent clinicians from whom I have learned a lot. So I would not identify myself as being in the anti-medicine camp or anything of that kind. And I did say at the beginning that in the longer paper, and certainly in my book, that I identify a lot of areas in which personalized medicine has made progress. And I, and I welcome that. But I'm merely acting as devil's advocate or whatever you want to call it uh, by saying that we mustn't forget we in the context of me because we hear a lot more about me. So I'm certainly not opposed and I always get a bit annoyed and I'm not annoyed at you, Jimmy. Um, but sometimes when I speak to journalists they say, oh, you're anti-science. Oh, oh, you're anti-medicine. No. <laughs> well, I mean, I've taught at Imperial College School soon. <laughs> Oxford, you know, Bristol, uh, these are pretty tough environments for a non-clinician. <laughs> and I've worked with a lot of excellent clinicians and published with a lot of excellent clinicians and have a lot of respect for clinicians. So I think that is just a, a cheap accusation, actually. Not you, but um, the accusation of Luddism, as it's often anti-science. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> Three, three more short words to Von Braun, Nicole, and Schachnove. Thank you. Thank you both for your stimulating talks. Uh, uh, a quick question to Donna Dickinson, uh, to you, Madam. Um, what incentive structures, what um, um, uh, political incentive regimes uh, would you propose uh, in order to come to a balanced approach that uh, facilitates the health ecosystem uh, using uh, common good approaches and the benefits of personalized medicine? Right. Um, if we are excessively on, on one or the other, mm -hmm. for instance, on the common good, it becomes a common bad for people who, are, um, who would benefit from uh, personalized medicine. So how to balance that? What incentives? And my question to Christopher Austin, um, in your field, it would uh, probably be, um, I would expect that um, uh, big data, and you mentioned that, um, and algorithms are key elements of uh, creating break breakthroughs. Um, how public uh, these algorithms? Uh, what's NIH policy? Should we have general policies for uh, making algorithms um, accessible so that there is 
common learning uh, with them and, and move forward. Can I start? Okay. Um, well, just to reiterate, I'm not saying that there is an opposition between communitarian medicine and personalized medicine. So I would not want to see any political mechanisms put in place that assume there was such an opposition, because I don't think it exists. Um, as I was saying in response to James' question. So I think what is important is that in systems which do not have the equivalent, say, of NICE, or I'm not saying that NICE is perfect by any means, but do not have a national body of any sort that takes these rationing decisions. They are rationing decisions. We do have to recognize that. Um, that we have adequate patient representation mechanisms, but not dominated by disease groups, that we use what mechanisms, mechanisms we have in law. I think, for example, the Myriad case has been tremendously important in the US, uh, which does not have a national allocation body, but which has got a sort of common law uh, substrate underlying. I think many countries, I would imagine Germany, I'm sure France, would be able to marshal these sorts of mechanisms whereby patients, professionals, and others can be brought into the debate. But I really think it's, and I know that's rather vague, but I really think it is very important that we not begin that process on the assumption that personalized medicine is against communitarian medicine or that communitarian medicine is against personalized medicine, that there is an opposition, but that we build bridges between them. Did you? Sorry, it's got a bit sweaty. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for the question. It's really a um, critical question for my own center, but also for NIH more broadly. In the same way that Eric was talking about the, um, the, the, the philosophy behind the Bermuda Principles, which were to make the genome data itself uh, publicly available. Um, <clears throat> and while there are uh, legal issues as far as uh, uh, who owns data supported by NIH, which probably shouldn't get into, um, it is very clear to us and I think everybody at NIH that in order to gather, in order to allow the kind of integration that is going to power what we're talking about, these data have got to be accessible and, and in the current vernacular FAIR, F-A-I-R, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, um, and most data have not been, um, not, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of data have not been outside of the genome data. Um, and uh, so in my own uh, center, we're doing something which um, directly addresses this, uh, something called the biomedical translator, which is, uh, which is actually taking uh, all the ways that one can characterize a human being from, their, from genetics all the way to disease names and all the ways you can classify it in between and then integrating those in, in making all the many-to-many -many con connections between them. And what we found in doing that is that NIH is its own worst enemy because many of the data sets that we and our collaborators want to put into this, uh, into this uh, linguistic and scientific translator are actually held back by the data use agreements which NIH agreed to, to begin with. So we, we can't even use the data that we funded. And so now we're having to go back to the grantees to say, you know, please let us access your data in, in the kind of way that we would want to. And, uh, and we're creating this whole platform in a completely open source way. Um, so that anybody would be able to access this and, uh, uh, and, and, then, and then adapt it for their own use. Um, but what, what we find over and over, and you're exactly right, is that the insights that we're looking for are come from that integration. And without that, we can't make the discoveries that allow us to move forward. I would make one point about why I'm, I'm actually, um, again, counterintuitively perhaps optimistic about the 
point that Dr. Dickinson was making, which is that what, what we found in, in rare diseases uh, is that, um, that paradoxically, uh, when people discover that they are individual, they have an individual problem that no one else has, it's terrifying. Because when you find that, there is no road to follow. So what happens, and this is really unexpected to us, is that in these efforts to individually, what is the matter with me or my child, when they find that, the first thing they do is look for other people mm. who have this, and, and the wonders of data sharing, if they're possible, actually allow them to identify a community of people who share their genetics. And, and it very quickly goes from me to at least a small we, a neighborhood. Uh, and, it's, and it's they that then create a neighborhood. And then what's happened is more and more people are having this experience, and then they come together based on that experience, and it creates a meta community. So I'm, I'm, I'm op cautiously optimistic that we will recreate the we from, from the I. If I may just continue with the theme of uh, keeping data open, I guess my um, issue with the Myriad case is what, what we saw after that was there was a flurry of activity to move towards trade secrecy. Mm. So for example, Myriad had an enormously valuable data set that it got from its period of, of monopoly that uh, it wasn't going to make um, publicly available. And, and there are other examples of companies that have moved towards that strategy of trade secrecy. And we've written about it, and Bob mm. Cook Deegan and others have written about it. So how do you actually avoid that? Do we just end up chasing our tails, as it were, as, as different ways are found of, mm. of making data, propri uh, propertizing data? Do you? Okay. <laughs> Just a, a quick question. <laughs> Just a quick question. Well, it's true that Myriad had one patient that wasn't overturned, <laughs> and they certainly took advantage of that. Um, I mean, I think this is really, you're the one who knows more about data sets, so would you like to answer the rest of it? Well, You've got your thing. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so I, um, Certainly, um, uh, the, 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 and it, it stands to, it, it's a general statement that, that of course, there is a, uh, a need in this space under certain circumstances for limited periods of time to have some kind of exclusivity. And you, you, you have to have that, uh, but, but it, it's, uh, but, but it's, it's getting the balance right, right? That, and that's the difficulty. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, Chris, there's no need for exclusivity under HIPAA. HIPAA extends now to a testing lab. Every patient has the right to have their full report, including their genetic sequence, immediately upon demand. If, we, if patients were to give to an agent like all patients were to sign up and say, as a breast cancer patient, I give to an agent my right to get that from Myriad. Myriad must, under law, turn it over immediately. It's simply we haven't organized to do it, but the law is clear that Myriad has no ability to have such a database be proprietary. And, and I, I think the, the, um, the, the Difficulty that that I think sometimes happens is that there there's this this um, uh, there's a mismatch between what the patient knows and what the company knows, and and you know this very well and 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 so th that that can create some of the problems and and actually you probably know in the all of us program the what's the the rebranded yeah. precision medicine initiative um, th th one of the principal tenets of that program is that individual patients will get all of their data back uh, on, on, on themselves, plus they will get aggregate data on the whole population. 
and it's a, it's a very different social contract than the way we've done research up yes. until now. Yeah. I don't know what is the me and the way to keep listening on having coffee outside, but after Professor Shekhanover we break and then we convene on time. Just a comment to Chris, uh, talk about the gap between uh, knowledge and translation. Uh, well, the gap is natural because knowledge always precedes uh, translation. It may behave in an unexpected way, like the SMA uh, story brought another story and another story and another story, so it may decrease and then may increase again once we are turning to the brain to psychiatric disease and may decrease again once we're going to know the generation because there may be, you know, these are all diseases of prototoxicity. That, but I think that one of the major obstacles on the way to translation is the IP fence between the source of knowledge, which is in many countries, in the universities, and the industry. You're coming to countries like Spain, like Japan, like South Korea, they have no idea of translation. They have no authority, patent, nothing. Researchers don't know anything about it. The industry doesn't have any access to it. In Israel, it's the opposite. You can do it in a day. You can take a patent, you know, within one day. Everybody knows exactly that it's 50% to the institute, 50% to the inventors. You can bring your own inventors, age, uh, angels, um, investing banks, whoever you want, and, and so on and so forth. So it depends on the ecosystem in the particular country, the speed of this translation, and it's nothing that has to do with knowledge. It's internal academic uh, and industrial culture. Well, yeah, I think all I would say is yes. I, I completely agree with you. The, the, I think the biggest surprise for me in this job over the last seven years or so has been that problem, the, actually the knowledge gap. Uh, and and the, how big the what uh, what people don't know they don't know uh, problem, um, it, and and so we're making a little headway with that, but it's it's a long way to go. Um, but I would say that that at the same time, you know, pat patents are uh, of course most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time important but they're um, usually necessary but never sufficient. And, and even when you have that, to actually get an intervention, a drug, a device, a behavioral intervention, whatever it is, that's, that then makes it to all the people who could benefit, many of those steps are independent of the patent, of course. Uh, and so much of what we're working on is, 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 uh, is, is most of it actually is post-patent um, and the science that goes into that. And I must say, much to my surprise, in, you know, because you know, our center, by design, doesn't do any basic research by, by design. We, we often discover basic things by working backwards from the pharmacology of living organisms, but we don't do it proactively. Uh, and so I expected that, that IP would be a big, big issue for us, and it actually has been one of the least of our problems. Once people understand it, of course, the U.S. is a probably as it's like Israel, it's quite, it's quite uh, educated in this domain, largely because of Baidol, which is the law that went into place a number of years ago about this. Um, but, but I think the, the, the knowledge of that map that I showed you, where the patent is in the upper left corner, that, that we often find is, is, is the current frontier of knowledge. Thank you very much to all of you. Let's have a brief coffee break. Ten minutes.